You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It's fairly common in history to talk about famous people, great heroes, but there are also little heroes. And Edwin Gray, who played a role in the savings and loan crisis, was just one of those little heroes and a member of a much maligned profession. Edwin Gray was a bureaucrat. Investors need to keep their finger on the pulse of change. Are we on the verge of a wage increase spiral? How is private capital changing the landscape for small firms? Can investors avoid greenwashing in their ESG exposure? Welcome to Season 2 of The Outthinking Investor, an award-winning podcast from PGM. Subscribe to PGM's The Outthinking Investor today for these insights and more. This podcast is intended solely for professional investor use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. March 1984, Ed Gray is the new chair of the FHLBB, a small, previously unknown agency that regulates savings and loans banks, and he receives a videotape in the mail from the Federal Home Loan Bank, FHLB, in Dallas. He and two other board members insert the tape into a VCR. A camera scans mile after mile of empty, unfurnished condominiums that had been built and were now left to rot. They were separated by stretches of arid flatland, and many were half-finished shells. A Dallas appraiser is narrating this video. It's homemade. Most of them have been financed by a savings and loan company called Empire Savings Bank. Regulators appalled and... He sends investigators to Texas to see this firsthand, and they confirm, and in fact, they're shocked by actually seeing it in person. A regulator says, I went down there, and this Texan showed me this piece of land and told me how this guy had sold it to that guy, and that guy had sold it again, and it had been sold about six times, each one generating a transaction and a loan. The regulator said, oh my God, that's terrible. And the man said, only if you're sixth. It was usually Empire or some other high-flying thrift that was the sixth in these transactions. Empire would grow from a 20 million thrift bank to a 330 million one. Most of it would have to be bailed out by taxpayers later. Those who have listened to me before know the story about, uh, a little bit, about John Paul Hammerschmidt, a congressman in the northern counties of Arkansas, the northern hill country, near the Missouri border and near the country capital, Branson. Hammerschmidt really ruled his congressional district from 1966 until 1993 when he decided to retire. He's a pretty popular Republican. Hammerschmidt often didn't even go back to his district to campaign much during elections. He usually stayed in Washington and he could raise money for other Republicans who were running Only one opponent ever really gave him a scare. James McDougall was not that opponent. James McDougall was well-funded, and he had a unique strategy that other Democrats hadn't done or couldn't do before. His strategy in the 1982 election was to buy every vote he could. And as the president of a looser, less regulated form of banking known as a savings and loan bank, he could. He was the president of Madison Guarantee Corporation and was in a unique position to loan and loan and loan more money that ostensibly was not his. Loan it to big farmers, small businessmen, precinct captains, leaders in various towns, anyone who might control a few votes for him in that 1982 election. By his own admission, he bought votes left and right. In the end, despite all his loaning and vote buying, McDougall got creamed. 34% of the vote. Not much worse than others. Probably better than a few others who would run against Hammersmith. They all got blown away, but not as good as the one Democrat who would give Hammersmith a really close race, almost beat him. And that man was a young University of Arkansas law professor named Bill Clinton. 
25-year-old would come really close. Now, 1974, when he ran, was a big Democratic year. Watergate helped, certainly. But so did Clinton's year of running through the local back counties and the district that Hammerschmidt didn't always get to. Clinton lost the race, but for even getting that close, he became a hero in the Democratic Party in Arkansas. Kind of a boy wonder of politics. And at age 27, he becomes the state attorney general. Age 31, the youngest governor in the nation. And his career is really going to rise. And and like most of Northwest Arkansas, McDougal lent Bill and Hillary Clinton money. Most notably, 200000 to buy property in a development called Whitewater. A property that the Clintons wish they hadn't invested in. It would collapse in value. And when McDougal's defaulted loans and tax evasion schemes caught up with them, he agreed to testify against the Clintons for a lighter sentence. Only his own death, McDougal's, in 1998 prevented this from happening. His wife Susan was also tried for contempt, jailed, was acquitted on some charges, settled out of court for malicious prosecution for some of the charges against her, and was eventually pardoned by Clinton for others. McDougal's Madison Guarantee Corporation and the firm he hired to represent it, which was Hillary Clinton's Rose Law Firm, would be part of Arkansas political legend and then national legend and would follow the Clintons into the White House and would play a role in elections. Eventually, this whole scandal would lead to the investigation that would lead to the investigation, the Lewinsky affair and Clinton's House impeachment. This is the way in which the Lewinsky affair and the impeachment of Clinton was related to that savings and loan crisis of the 1980s and early 1990s. And part of what allowed James McDougal to help this young Democratic governor political up and what helped McDougal to write loans to whomever he wanted for his congressional campaign was the political polar opposite in the White House. Republican President Ronald Reagan and his administration. But the SNL crisis starts a little earlier than that, very early. Really think about it. Banking becomes a concern of the federal government in the very beginning of the United States. Alexander Hamilton theorized, what if the federal government did more than just tax and then spend only what it's collected? A cash-based system, just as if you were paid in cash and simply could only spend the money that was actually in your wallet or your bank account, but nothing else. Well, that might be good as a person. Maybe it's a noble way to be. But as a country, what if instead of that, the new federal United States government could assume the debts of all the states which they had occurred in the Revolutionary War and then take that debt on? relieve the states of their debt, create bonds, and then sell the debt to other more wealthy individuals around the country. They could do that, as opposed to the 13 states. The federal government had the credibility of the world. Look at what the nation we want independence of from was doing. The British Empire was lending and lending. Banking on its sterling credit. This was a new United States, and there was a lot of faith in this new experiment in democracy. Faith that they could capitalize on, literally, by selling bonds. But further than that, what if you created a bank of the United States that would collect the tax revenue the United States government was collecting from excises, taxes, and instead of just merely collecting that money and spending it, they could, like any bank, lend against it. Financial progress that the nation needed. Roads, canals, new businesses. Hamilton wasn't all altruistic. It wasn't all about being patriotic or forward-looking. The wealthy lawyers in New York, who were his patrons, supporters, and clients, even his family, his, his in-laws, <laughs> owned New York state bonds. And they probably had little hope of those increasing in value except to be sold to some large entity like the new United States government. Perhaps still, Hamilton's assumption plan created a boom of sorts in the economy right in the early years when the new government needed it most. And it certainly did much to make a poor nation a richer one, a nation capable of doing things for itself, building canals, roads. And unlike the multiple state governments, a federal government bond was something that nations of the world could sink their teeth into especially the Amsterdam Dutch, who, after all, had created banking or perfected it, hadn't they? So 
banking becomes a federal concern, a topic of federal regulation, and savings and loans banks come out of a tradition of what was called building and loans bank, first in Britain, and then the concept comes to the United States. It was a type of smaller, leaner bank. It would only do home mortgages. You're not getting that far from the early founding of the nation when the first savings and loan is established in Pennsylvania in 1831. And they're designed to be organized by groups of people, not necessarily professional bankers, who wish to buy their own homes but lack sufficient savings to purchase them. Not all banks lent money for residential mortgages in the 1800s. So... Members of a group would pool their savings, lend them back to a few of the members to finance home purchases. As the loans were repaid, could lend those funds to other members. That's why they're sometimes called thrift banks. And it was seen as a form of social progress. These were banks for working men to help get them into homes. They boomed and they busted at different times in America. In the 19th century, after World War II, savings and loans or thrift banks offered servicemen coming home a better return on deposits and better mortgage rates than other banks could. But after the 1960s, they started to suffer from a variety of ills. And this will sound odd in a story that's often associated with deregulation. The first blow to hit the savings and loan industry was regulation. They were regulated as far as what they could pay out on deposits, and especially when interest rates increased in the late 1970s. This was a problem. The first to help these thrift banks was the Carter administration, which urged Congress to grant thrifts the power to make loans, most notably what would be called ATC loans, for development and construction. So we're now not just savings and loan banks, meaning just home mortgages. We're not just making loans on existing home properties. You could have loans to buy land, develop the land, construct a home. A little more risky. The Federal Home Loan Banking Board, the the government agency that regulated the thrifts and loans, also increased the amount that thrifts deposits were insured for, from $40,000 to $100,000. Whereas before, a wealthy individual putting money into a savings and loan would either have to split the money between several banks in order to have it all insured or reduce the amount of money they put into thrifts. This increased the amount of money that could go into thrifts to increase their assets ostensibly. But it also increases taxpayer liability. A mat change was done before President Reagan took office. It was done by the Carter administration. So one step that occurred during the Carter administration that helped the crisis along, thrifts were allowed to get certificates of deposits from brokers. Brokers could be from around the country and would look for savings and loans anywhere that would give them the best rate. The sets a race to the bottom. Thrifts were offering higher and higher interest rates to get deposits in. These deposits had no loyalty to the local community. A wealthy individual from New York, for instance, could take their 100000 and shop it around for the best rate. Why not? Whether they put their money in a bank in New York or in Connecticut or a bank in New Jersey or Texas or California, that money was guaranteed by the federal government to the tune of 100000 So it was just about getting the best interest rate, and it was safe money. How did the thrifts, though, that that bank, that savings and loan in Texas that was taking the 100000 how did they pay for this very expensive money? Well, it might cost them 6 to 10% to get the money, but they would lend out the money at higher rates. And how did they do that? By looking for investments that were a bit riskier than they normally would have. This not only affected savings and loans, but it also creeped into the regular banking industry who was competing with the savings and loans. Most of this occurred during the Carter administration. And when Ronald Reagan takes office, he's running on many issues, but one of them particularly being, I'm going to get Washington out of people's lives, right? Savings and loans were part of the growth of the West now, an area that gave Reagan much of his electoral support. A good number of these thrifts, indeed, were in uh, Texas, California, Arizona, Colorado, 
at this time, we're talking about 1980s, early 1980s. Reagan states, Treasury Secretary Donald Reagan saw them as the cornerstone of the business in the Reagan era. And the director of the Federal Home Loan Banking Board, Richard Pratt, saw no reason to regulate them and encourage Congress to help them out. Congress, who is also receiving generous contributions from this budding savings and loan industry, responded with legislation that allowed savings and loans to raise rate, make, cons- make consumer loans, and make commercial loans. All right, so now we're not just talking about, hey, you can develop this land and build a home there. Now it's even commercial loans. And the amount of net worth that a savings loan needed to have versus what they lent it out went from 5% to 3%. But even that belies the truth because some of these net worth assets that they could show could be notes that were provided by the Treasury Department under Don Reagan's management. Those would be the assets of the bank. And a couple of situations made it even worse. Even the 3% net worth requirement backed up in many cases by those notes, the bank could phase that in. So if a savings and loan was around 20 years, they had to meet the 3% requirement. But those that hadn't been around 20 years could phase it in. So newer banks had even less requirements. State began to follow these new federal loose rules to avoid banks from leaving their charter and going and getting chartered in the federal government banking system. So you even have kind of a race to the bottom in regulation among the 50 states. In this environment, between state and federal loosening of regulation on these banks, 686 thrifts from around the nation became 1,068. From 1982 to 1985, the thrift industry assets grow 56%, more than twice the 24% rate observed by regular banks during the same time. It's fueled by an influx of deposits and thrifts that begin paying higher and higher rates. In 1978, over 80% of the assets of savings and loans are in home mortgages. By 1986, that's about 50%. 500 new savings and loan charters are issued between 1980 and 1986. And it's 1984 and 1985 where the real peak occurs with 200 savings and loans. Texas is kind of an epicenter for this whole thing. With a, It would end up being about 40% of the banks that are going to need to be bailed out. And examiners were few in number and underpaid. As early as 1983, before anyone knew that there was a savings and loan crisis, 35% of the savings and loans banks were insolvent. Even using the relaxed accounting standards that the Reagan administration allowed, these standards meant that they could loan all the money up front, including interest, and then show that money as their income. This was called regulatory accounting practices versus gap general accounting practices that are used by most corporations. So one million loaned out could garner 240,000 of interest to the bank over the life of that loan. They would show that 240,000 as income in the first year, though the interest is paid only from loan proceeds. What are these relaxed regulatory accounting procedures? It meant that if I loan you 200 and say, you have two years to pay me $10 in interest. I went to the bank and took out $210, handed you $200, and myself the $10. And then I report that I received that $10 in income. I did not. Two years haven't passed. I haven't collected that interest from you, yet here I am recording this $10 that I received. Except we're not talking about $10. That's what banks did in order to inflate their own net earnings. And borrowers certainly didn't mind. They were getting a great loan at a good price for an investment they needed, often too risky in most cases for banks to do. I mean, there's banks in Texas where they're talking about just loaning out money to, say, people to build an oil rig. And where normally you might have to mortgage some of that equipment, nah, just make it an unsecured loan. You know, as if it's like a personal loan that you might get now with obviously a high interest rates and a lot of rules. No, they could loan at regular rates and make loans that regular banks could not do. And always the excuse would be, well, 
If you don't let the guy have his rig, you're denying business. The head of the bank board, Richard Pratt, didn't see any problem with the loosening regulations of savings and loans. Saw it as a way of helping a sick industry. Probably more important than any change the Congress or administration made. The FHLBB under Pratt ended the requirement that SNLs have 400 local stockholders. This, the local stockholder factor, is what made them, like the original 1831 bank, made them different from most banks. Now in the 80s, one person, one person could have complete control of that savings and loan. This more than any other change led to problems. Instead of having 400 members of the local community looking out for the health of the bank, one person could loot the bank. But after making these changes, Richard Pratt left for a lucrative job on Wall Street, Merrill Lynch, and an unknown assistant of Edwin Meese, who was Reagan's attorney general during his presidency and also during his governorship of California, was solicited for a job, a person who had a small job in the White House. He took over. His name was Edwin Gray. He had served in the Reagan White House in a small policy job, and then he had gone home to San Diego where he worked for a local savings and loan bank. As a Reagan loyalist, who was also in the thrift agency, the SNL industry was delighted to see Edwin Gray take the chair. He was, as Edwin Gray would admit, considered to be a patsy for the industry. And as Greg said, they didn't know me very well. Then again, I didn't know myself very well. So Gray is appointed swiftly, little opposition. But when Gray learns of the problem with many of these new savings and loans banks as early as 1983, he proposed what was seen as a minor change. He wanted to um, at least prevent the broker deposits from coming in. So now they could get deposits from the local community, but not put it out nationally, encouraging the most risky loans. Great idea. Makes sense. Don Regan, the Reagan Treasury Secretary, objects, as did the thrift industry. But still, Gray was able to get his change through. Unfortunately, the courts overturned him. Regan complained that Gray was not a team player now. Regan also controlled the bank examiners who worked for Treasury and not for Gray and weren't working quick enough. Gray tried to get OMB examiners to report to him, not Regan. For this, he was called a regulator by David Stockman, Regan's budget chief. In the early 80s, and this is before Stockman himself would turn against his own administration in a lot of ways, regulator was one of the biggest insults. So in 1983, when Grace first notices something wrong with these savings and loans, the SNL problem is estimated was huge. It would cost something like $9.5 billion to fix it. But no one was even thinking about fixing it then. Gray was not against deregulation completely. For example, in the airlines, he favored deregulation. But savings and loans were not the airlines. They were an industry backed by by taxpayers for their losses. If an airline loses money, it's not paid by Joe Public. Although there can be support and assistance, we've seen that. But if a thrift loses money, its depositors are fully insured. By 1986, two factors further swayed savings and loans in their decline. One was low energy prices, damning developments in some of these states where they were growing fast, particularly Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. And you'll still find people that say those loans could have have been paid back if oil prices were still high like the late 70s. Well, coulda, shoulda. And then the 1986 Tax Reform Act that's passed limits how much money can be written off from investments in real estate. This drops the values of real estate at this point in 1986. But let's say, okay, after the decline in oil prices and after the 1986 Tax Reform Act and the problem is clear, let's say, say in 87, the problem had been stopped. The SNL solution might have been estimated at $80 billion. Gray makes many attempts to see President Reagan to discuss the objection to what was going on in savings and loans. He was never brought in to see the president. And therefore, Reagan could claim that he was not aware of the problem. But Reagan wasn't the only one that stood in his way. And neither were just Republicans. Majority leader and future speaker Jim Wright blocked anything having to do with savings and loans, where among his best customers 
and donors to write in the Democratic Congress work. And uh, Edwin Gray learns a lot about Washington when he goes to visit Speaker Wright. He needs to get his fund, the fund that backs up savings and loans, the FSLIC, he has to get it renewed. Here's what Gray says in an interview later. We were experiencing $10 million in operating losses a day, and they were climbing. Every hour counted. I've been warning for years that this would be paid for by taxpayers if we weren't careful. I'm the third most powerful man in the country, talking about Jim Wright, Speaker of the House. He was doing nothing, holding a bill hostage for some constituents of his. What about all the other constituencies in the country? Weren't there other taxpayers in Texas who were being set up to pay these bills because of delays? This is what Gray is saying. Did Wright seem to be aware of the financial issues that were facing the FSLC? Well, he said to me, I don't know much about this. He himself said that. So I took 40 minutes to make sure he understood everything, the gravity of our situation at the FSLIC, what we were trying to do, the purpose, and why it was important that he take action to renew this. I told Wright we were moving towards insolvency at the FSLIC, and that we had many difficult institutions to deal with. I said, I want to emphasize, Congressman, that our remaining dwindling reserves stand behind more than $800 billion in deposits. And he said to me, would you repeat that? I said, there's $2 billion standing behind $800 billion in deposits. He said, hmm, and he wrote it down. But what Gray perceives to actually have happened is that that FSLIC recapitalization bill is held up in Congress. It cannot move because of Gray's activities regulating these banks. Here's what Gray says. The more I raised my concerns, the more industry became annoyed. They didn't like the message. This often occurs in Washington. They tried to make the criticism personal about me. In Washington, when opponents dislike your politics, they typically call you a poor manager and criticize you personally in many ways. Basically, many in the industry just wanted me to sweep the problem under the rug, as though it might then just disappear. Build a path to brand success through CoverMyMed's unique combination of patient-centric technology-enabled solutions that may help accelerate time to therapy and reduce prescription abandonment for your brand. Discover a comprehensive, connected suite of solutions for pharmaceutical brands and get support no matter where you are in the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit commercialization.covermymeds.com. This episode is brought to you by Carvana. They'll drive you happy. Carvana has purchased over a million cars from happy customers by giving them an offer within minutes. And they can do the same for you. Carvana will give you a real offer for your car within minutes. Then they'll come to pick up your car and pay you on the spot. So to get a real offer on your vehicle in minutes, download the app or visit Carvana.com. But surely the most well-known interference occurs in April 1987 in the office of Senator Dennis DeConcini of Arizona. Present was his fellow senator in the state of Arizona, John McCain. So was Senator Alan Cranston, Democrat of California, Dan Regal, Democrat of Michigan, and John Glenn of Ohio. Charles Keating, who they meet with, is a contributor to all of these five. He's a business partner of Cindy McCain, personal friend of hers. Alan Cranston uses the money from Lincoln Savings, which is Charles Keating's savings, to wants a large Democratic turnout drive in California. And we can switch this state Democrat to the Democratic Party if we just get people out to vote. He needs 100,000. You know, and, and that doesn't sound like a lot. It is in these times. Because it's not just inflation. Political money was harder to come by. You didn't have the internet to raise money. So you're only talking about uh, large money donations. A couple hundred bucks was a large amount. You want 100000 it's going to have to come from a big source. The senators meet with Keating. Then they meet with the bank examiners who were looking at Lincoln Savings and Loan. And they asked the regulators to slow down the investigation for the bank regulators. The meeting with these five senators, senators being among the most powerful people in Washington, was uncomfortable to say the least. Later, when the examiners told the senators They were close to filing criminal charges against Keating. The senators, except for Cranston, 
backed off. Cranston still kept telling, helping Keaton, even after the criminal charges are filed. Eventually, the media get hold of this meeting with the five senators as early as 1987. But it's not till 1989 when the scandal crisis had finally reached the media and the consciousness of the public that the Keating Five became a household name. Cranston's reprimanded by the Senate Ethics Committee for his actions during that time. Gray was fighting a lonely battle within the administration, trying to see President Reagan, trying to get bank examiners to work for the Office of Management and Budget, controlled by Don Regan, to work for him, to work for Gray, to get closer to the banks they were examining, to see what they were doing, the type of investments they were putting their money in, to actually look at these banks' books. Frustrated, Gray would eventually hire his own bank examiners out of his own budget, and he would earn the wrath of both the Democratic Congress and the Republican administration for doing this. Don Regan, Reagan's Treasury Secretary and later Chief of Staff, would see that reporters leaked unfavorable information about Gray. And President Reagan appointed a Keating loyalist named Lee Hinkle to the FL, FHLB board in order to outvote Gray every time and represent the thrift industry better. Hinkle lasts only six months because it's revealed that he was regulating banks that he had ownership shares in. Even as he's trying to do things right, Republican Party friends of Gray tell him that he's now persona non grata in this party. And he ought to just get away from Washington. One of his friends in California, who had been a lifelong friend prior, saw Gray ruining the party's relationship with the thrift industry, which was a main source of campaign funds for the Republican Party in 1987. It was like their number one funding source running up to the 1988 election. Gray's term as chairman of the FHLB board expired, and he was not renominated. According to Bill Black, a bank examiner at the time, and now a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, Ed Gray's actions probably staved off an immediate recession. And even though the solution would cost taxpayers billions during the Bush administration, it could have been trillions. President Reagan replaces him with a pro-thrift deregulation advocate. Then you reach the election year of 1988, and with two parties competing, questioning each other, with an opposition party attacking an administration, certainly issues will come to right, to light. A little, but searching the 1988 Democratic Party platform, one finds not at all the mention of the word saving or loan or even bank. Democrats barely raised the issue. How could they? Many Democrats were forceful supporters of the thrift industry and relied on their funds for the campaign. When Dukakis is nominated in Atlanta in 1988, the chairman of that convention is James Wright, Speaker of the House. He's one of the thrift's biggest advocates. It's not until you get to the Bush administration when President Bush must form the Resolution Trust Corporation to resolve the now hundreds of insolvent SNLs with funds guaranteed by taxpayers. Although the Resolution Trust Corporation attempted to sell some of the insolvent thrifts and some of their assets, a lot of the investments just had no worth. Only about $9 billion was raised from any of these sales. In a famous case in Texas, they it's easier for them to burn down condos that were built than try to sell them. The cost of the taxpayers was nearly $160 billion. And between taxpayers' funds of 130 appropriated Congress and the remainder tax on the thrift industry, really meaning a tax on those healthy savings and loans who hadn't participated in some of the bad activities that the insolvent ones had to pay for the thousand banks that were insolvent. It's... uh. Um, let me do that quick calculation, money over time. So straight CPI calculation, you're talking about $300 billion at least. Uh, there's other ways, like say the value of a worker's wage and things where uh, that might even go up. Uh, let's put it this way. It's, a, it's much more common these days for Congress to appropriate $300 billion than it was for Congress to appropriate 
$160 billion on a domestic single concern in those days. So let's put it that way. There's even one more remaining chapter of the savings and loan crisis, and that is that the Resolution Trust Corporation forced some healthy and insolvent banks to merge in order to save some of the banks and stop the bleeding a bit. Okay, we're going to force you to merge. In 1996, the Supreme Court ruled that was unconstitutional. Then there were thousands of lawsuits regarding these goodwill cases, um, possibly you know costing an, another five or six billion. Not all of them were settled. And Edwin Gray, not surprisingly, Gray had trouble getting a go- job in government. He was, as that friend told him, a persona non grata in the party. There was no position for him in the new Bush administration. He also had some f- trouble with his friends in the private sector, not just banks, but some of the companies who were benefiting from that investment money. Eventually, though, Gray does get a job, and he's the president of a Miami thrift and bank. He actually had to step down from that after a few years. We don't find too much more about Edwin Gray's and a few pages of books about Reagan Googling him, except for some mentions during the savings and loan crisis, you don't find much there. The battle of a bureaucrat, the battle of a bureaucrat, it seems, is a hidden one. What lessons are there in the savings and loan crisis? The large expenditure of money in the early 1990s because of some of that calculation of money over time, may be a black mark that we haven't learned enough from. Process. It's a small word with big implications. Because whatever an idea starts, a process gets done. It's how big talk drives real action and people achieve their best work. At Smartsheet, we're in the process business. The go-to for managers who love pulling in the right combination of data, tools, and people from across the company to make it happen. One platform, every project, any scale. It doesn't get bigger than that. Smartsheet. Power your process. Visit smartsheet.com forward slash power your process. And uh, this cast was originally written, recorded in 2007. And uh, I'm re-recording it, adding a little bit, checking some of the, the notes. And I said at that time, it's just one more example as in 1819, as in 1857, as in 1873 and 2008 of over-speculation and over-easy credit leading to a crash that would also trigger a recession. In almost every case, it seems to happen. So this is what I said back in 2009. And I'm gonna gonna kind of read it back to myself and absorb it a bit. So I said then, who represents people when both parties are in collusion? Who does the right thing? Gray made a distinction between taxpayer supported industry and non taxpayer supported industries where he could allow deregulation. A more complex rather than ideological approach might have assisted. The snowball of credit, speculation, and then triggering donations to politicians and economic growth in their districts makes it impossible to expect elected politicians to be the future guards against these type of crises. So what do we do? What do we do when faced with such a large expansion of credit that we just can see is going to fall out with huge expense to taxpayers and probably to our economy? Some new legislation is probably the answer, and that's being advocated today with the current banking crisis. The legislation can be easily repealed by Congress, just as easily can be enacted. It's not useless because it does take a vote in order to repeal it, and there's some questioning at the time, but it's fairly easy to repeal. We repealed Glass-Steagall, which uh, came out of the 30s, Carter Glass, Virginia Senator, wanted to separate banks from the investment business. We repealed that in the late 90s under the Clinton administration. Banks got involved in investments, and that helped, among many other factors, to propel the 2008 crisis. We can rely on regulators, but the problem is regulators still work for the government, and the government is in the hands of 
and the government's run by Congress. The government's run by Congress and the administration. We can give the power to stop excessive speculation to the president. Now, in the 1980s, under President Reagan, I'm, this obviously would not have worked well, but in other cases it might. The members of the Constitutional Convention saw the president, saw the chief executive, as one person who could take control when the body of Congress was just responding to, you know, not what the right thing was to do, but to what people wanted in the short term. The president was somebody who could look out for the national interest. So giving the president the lever to then say, to, to veto aggressive speculation in the market, uh, you know, to veto some of the regulatory rules, only in the negative and not in the positive. In other words, the president can veto it, but not open it up more. That would have to be a vote of Congress. Could assist, assuming, though, that the right individual is in the presidency. Easier for one man to make that determination. The more successful examples in history have been independent entities, or quasi-independent entities. You have the Federal Reserve System, which controls interest rates. Every president wants low interest rates. Federal Reserve manages that process. And while they're not completely independent, a six-year term is a long time for governor of the board of the Federal Reserve. The base closing commission. Here's an example of a commission that handles a process that nobody in Congress wants, which is to close bases. It's independent. It still has to report to Congress. It still faces some pressures, but it does a much better job of managing an uncomfortable process that nobody likes, but has to be done. In effect, what you need is a form of an economic Supreme Court. Somebody who's appointed long terms, who can examine a situation in the middle of a speculative bubble and perhaps stop the process. This is a more general statement, I realize, and I don't have all the specifics of, of legislation, but it's the type of things politicians should be thinking now. There's a lot of talk now about regulations, whether they'll even be just a simple new regulations on bank from the Congress. But in the midst of a speculative period, those regulations could be thrown out the window. Harder to dissolve a board, not impossible, harder. There's a few other ideas. One would be, we hope to rely on the media a little bit more to watch out for these type of situations before they happen. Not only the official media, but the blogs. And probably last, there's a simple measure. Anytime a new regulation is voted, perhaps you can require Congress to write into the legislation how much the bailout would be if it goes south. To make an estimate, maybe the GAO makes an estimate, and perhaps even force Congress to bond money towards a bailout. That would make the decision to hit the gas pedal on deregulation a little bit, a little bit harder to do. I called for an economic Supreme Court. Somebody said appointed, appointed over the long term. I mean, this was kind of the mechanism behind the Federal Reserve Board. Um, it certainly hasn't done anything to stop all the speculative investment and recessions. That certainly hasn't worked that way. I don't know that... You know, the presidency, we know different people take that office at different times. Maybe one president would be willing to hit the brake for the good of the country. Uh, others may not. There'd certainly be a lot of pressure on them, but I'm not totally resistant to the idea. I, I love the idea of including a bailout in the language over something like that, a bailout estimate. When... Uh, Looser regulations are passed. Yeah, so I, I find myself in a lot of ways still agreeing with my uh, 2009 self there. <laughs> I mean, I might add, you know, think about the one of the things the founders were, were good at is that kind of concurrent federal state government, but all, you know, moving the power around a bit into different places and maybe there's a role for the states in some of this, uh, in, in deciding, uh, if you want this kind of looser regulation. I mean, I, I did this podcast originally, that was right at the height and we didn't know where that 
recession was going to go yet. And it did turn out to be pretty bad. Um, I remember that well, by the way, um, recording the podcast during the recession of 2008 and specifically doing an episode on the Great Depression because I wanted to know, in addition to, I'm sure, my listeners about what it might be like. And it was terrible for many. I mean, um, 21st century terrible, I guess, but still terrible. I want to thank you for listening and uh, for hearing out this little bit about the savings and loan crisis. One thing to take note of in general here, be careful if interest rates go way up. Inflation continues where it's been going. Well, it's slowed a little. Gas prices, energy prices at least slowed a little, but who knows? It's going to be a big winner. Um, be careful if the first answer people go to is starting to mess with banks and mess with regulation of banks. Make it, quote, easier. Because we are getting many years from 78 when that first legislation was passed. And when that legislation is passed, there's barely a word about savings and loans, by the way. That has a, about 100 different things that the 1978 bill does. Relating A lot of it relates to consumer privacy. So it seems like a good bill in the wake of some of the things that was going on, like let's say with FBI investigations of people and the like. It was a consumer credit privacy act in, in many ways. But it also had some of these savings and loan provisions. Um, it was seen as something as cleaning up banking after um, Carter's uh, budget director resigned in a banking scandal with the involving a bank, a regular bank that he was managing in Georgia. So there was like really a lot of other side stories when that bill's passed. And really that bill alone does not turn into the savings and loan crisis. We can look at the measure. Most of it's going to start in the early 80s where there's really billions on the hook. Okay. But I would be careful in current times if you start hearing people saying, oh, you got to, you know, these interest rates are high. We really got to find a way to get people credit and get this economy moving again. Yeah. 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 Be careful. I want to thank you for listening.